welcome to the download where we bring you discussion and analysis from a Catholic perspective. Today is November 2nd, 2023. I'm Bradley Eli here with my two co-hosts, Kyle Kopey and Christine Niles. Today is All Souls Day, so of course we want to talk about the souls in purgatory, praying for the dead, and the four last things. To start off today, let's look at a little portion of the liturgy for All Souls Day. Traditionally, during the Mass on All Souls Day, the choir chants a hymn called the Dies Irae. It's what's called a sequence, a long hymn prior to the Gospel. Here's the opening stanza, as translated by our producer, David Newsman. Quote, The day of wrath, that day, will consume the age in smoldering ashes by testimony of David, along with the Sibyl. End quote. It references King David because he authored the Psalms, and there are passages in the Psalms that appear to reference the Day of Judgment. Likewise, it mentions the Sibyl, a term for a certain type of pagan prophetess in the days of ancient Rome. Some of the prophecies attributed to the Sibyls apparently foretold destruction and the end of the world. All of this goes to show in the middle of a mass praying for those who have died. Holy Mother Church turns to us briefly and reminds us, you too shall die. What do you, uh, you know, that, that really uh, hits home when we're starting to, we think about, you know, the Dia's Ira starts up and some people just break down and crying. I mean, some people are like really hit by that. And that type of soberness doesn't really come into the modern uh, mindset of many um, pastors today, Catholics today, unfortunately. They just don't really see that, uh, you know, kind of all people are saved. Everybody should pretty much, I was thinking about that when I was in my 20s. You know, everybody must pretty much go to heaven unless you're really evil and you killed a little old lady and you're really not sorry about it at all. But otherwise, you know, pretty much everybody goes to heaven. And really that's not where the, the gospel is at, to, you know, if you start getting into it, not where Holy Mother Church was at. So, um, yeah, it's kind of interesting to actually look at some of these things. Mass for the dead, chants and prayers, they really started um, that theme of praying for the departed. The church really is concerned about people's souls, and I think that's the greatest alarming thing when we start talking about the new paradigm shift and all that today. We're kind of looking at, you know, not really focused too much. We don't really have a healthy fear of, of um, judgment anymore. No, because everyone uh, will be judged and that's what people forget. They just, they live their lives with the blinders on. Uh, I'm gonna live forever because they think that, you know, modern technology is, uh, you know, anesthetizing me to the discomforts of the world. Uh, I'm gonna live, you know, I'm gonna live till I'm 100. You don't know that. You don't know when you're gonna go. And when you do go, uh, the church teaches us that you'll go through a particular judgment. So there's two types of judgments in Catholic theology. There's what's called the particular judgment and then the final judgment at the end of the time. So when an individual dies, he goes through what's called a particular judgment. So he will stand before our Lord. And I mean, this is a scary thing to think about, but our Lord will go through all of your sins, every single one, every single venial sin, mortal sin, imperfection, and you will be judged on that. And you will see not only that you did it, but how it affected your own soul, how God was indignant at the the fact that you committed that particular, even if it's a venial sin, you'll see how that sort of affects God. He'll show all of that to you. Uh, it's sort of this, you know, you know, people are like, well, how's this going to be? It's going to be a big, long speech God gives you. No, it's sort of this intellectual thing that you just know, but it will happen to you. Uh, and that's going to happen to everyone, whether you go, you know, 50 years from now or five minutes from now. So you have to be ready for your own particular judgment. And then at the end of the world, there will be a second judgment, a final judgment where humanity will, number one, be judged as a collective whole, but also, too, because of the communal nature of our sin. You know, your sin just doesn't affect you, it, it, especially if you're in the body of Christ. It affects the entire body of Christ. It affects all of humanity, actually, in a certain sense. And God is going to show you, he's going to show every single sin of every single person to everyone. So it's all going to be opened up right then and there. And it's also going to show everyone the, the communal effects of your sin. How did your sin, your own personal sin, affect the body of Christ? How did it affect this person? How did it affect that person? So, I mean, the, the onus on us as, as the church militant right now to get our lives right with God, to avoid mortal sin especially, to try to avoid our attachments to all venial sin, um, that really should be in the forefront of our mind. Yeah, and just as a clarification, we should, because we have people 
writing to us about this before, but it's, it's your unconfessed, unrepented of, unabsolved sins that God will bring to you. If, you there, if you're confessed, if you're absolved, Scripture promises God will not bring that up. And Scripture says right here in Isaiah 43, 25, I, I am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake, and I will not remember your sins. Hebrews 8, 12, for I will be merciful toward their iniquities, and I will remember their sins no more. He's referring, obviously, to the sins that we have repented of, gone to confession for, uh, have been absolved. So, so there's some hope there. So just get to confession. If you have, if you have any sins, go and, and go to confession. But, you know, this today is All Souls Day, as we mentioned, and November is just a wonderful month to think about the things that both of you just brought up, and also just to remember the dead. You know, today is the day that we think about the holy souls in purgatory and the fact that they're utterly helpless to expiate their own sins. They can't do it. They have to just serve out the sentence that God has given to them. Uh, we here on earth can help them. So just a reminder that the church offers a plenary indulgence every single day up through November 8th. Um, you can obtain one every single day under the usual conditions. In this case, you just visit a cemetery, say some prayers for the dead. It could be an eternal rest, divine mercy chaplet, whatever prayers you want to pray. Um, and then also, of course, receive communion and confession. Usually it's within like two weeks before or after. Um, and then offer, offer some prayers for the Holy Father. Usually in Our Father, Hail Mary suffices. And today, especially All Souls, there's a special plenary indulgence where you can visit a cemetery, recite prayers for the Holy Father, for the dead, and also recite the creed. Uh, but the wonderful thing is each day you can obtain a plenary indulgence for one soul in purgatory who is then released from his suffering and able to go to heaven. And the thing is, the Holy Souls are so incredibly great grateful for the help that we give them. They will repay us a hundredfold and they will help us here in this life and they'll help us on our deathbed as well. Um, I, you guys were having a conversation before that you were told wrongly uh, that the Holy Souls cannot pray for us. That is completely, that's, that's completely wrong. In fact, I want to share a wonderful anecdote and this comes from a Pope. I've shared it before on the download, but this is a true anecdote. This is from uh, blessed Pope Pius IX. There was he, he appointed a very pious priest to become bishop of a particular diocese. And the priest who just wanted to be a pastor said, please, 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 I don't want to be bishop. I don't want to do this. I just want to stay and you know, serve my flock. Um, and the, this is from Blessed Pius XI. He wrote, quote, your diocese is very small in comparison with the universal church, which I carry on my shoulders. Your cares will be very light in comparison with mine. Um, I too suffered from a grave defect of memory because that's what the priest was saying. Oh, I can't remember things. I can't govern. So the Pope says, I too suffered from a grave defect of memory, but I promised to say a fervent prayer daily for the holy souls who in return have obtained for me an excellent memory. Do you likewise, dear father, and you will have cause to rejoice. So the Holy Father promised, I will pray for you, but you pray for me to get an excellent memory. And that's exactly what they did. They can do the same thing for us. Yeah, this idea that um, they can't help themselves, but they can still help us as part of the church. Um, uh, the communal communion of saints was something I think both of us were having a problem with early on in life. We both understood that, oh no, well the poor souls can't pray or do anything or, or what. And that, well, that wasn't actually the full story. And then uh, later on, I'm finding out that, as you did too, that wow, the, the poor souls can pray for you. You actually can pray to the poor souls, have a devotion to them, praying for them, but also praying to them uh, was something that was really mind blowing. You you had the similar experience. Similar experience, yeah. Um, I don't know where or who you know talked me this erroneous thing, but it was just one of those many things you, you learn as a, as a young Catholic that you have to sort of relearn as an older Catholic. Unfortunately, you do your own research and you find out, well, yeah, some people were leading me astray, you know, unfortunately. But, uh, you know, when, when we talk about, uh, you know, this whole idea of, you know, where are we going to end up in our particular judgment um, and even in the final judgment too, you know, some people have this erroneous idea that the final judgment is going to somehow um, override your particular judgment. It's like, well, no, God's not going to change his mind. If you were condemned to hell or if you were, you know, blessed to be part, you know, part of the beatific vision, you know, he's not going to condemn you to hell from the beatific vision. Some people actually think that, but the final judgment has no bearing on where you're going to end up eternally. It's, it's a little, it's something a little different there. Um, and then too, you know, people kind of get obsessive compulsive about this idea about thinking about death and judgment. Not that it's not important, you know, but there's an extreme that you can go to where I think it is, it 
is actually unhealthy. So really, I mean, just the focus there on living a good moral life, a strong spiritual life, this comes from not so much out of, out of a fear of going to hell and or just trying to trying to get to heaven. Um, you know, th that's the false dichotomy here. It's kind of like when, um, you know, we talk about confession. Perfect contrition, imperfect contrition. Imperfect contrition is you're making this confession simply out of a fear of hell. And that's okay. That actually suffices for your forgiveness there. But it's imperfect. The perfect contrition is an act of charity. You're doing this out of pure love for God or as much as you're able to do. And that's what the kind of what we need to keep in our mind when we're talking about, you know, this, this idea of avoiding being condemned at our particular judgment. We're doing this out of love, our, love of God because we want to follow his commandments and we want to be with him forever in heaven. The uh, proper fear really is a not a servile fear that I myself am going to be punished by a, uh, a very, you know, vicious dictator, God, but actually uh, a fear of offending someone you love very much, someone who you don't want to offend, that you don't want to hurt that relationship that you have with God. And that was the type of thing that, um, you know, if there was this uh, servile fear maybe before, I'm just going to throw a dart out there, not that Vatican II, I really don't believe, changed in and of itself these things. It's just kind of a timeline in the 60s. Um, prior to that, if there was more of an emphasis on like a servile fear of suffering in hell, today we just have almost a, uh, an absence of even a thought of that going to hell whatsoever. If there was a neuroses, you know, to borrow a psychological term, uh, prior to today, there's this overwinning uh, presumption, almost like a pseudo psychopathic thing that I just can't be held accountable for these things. So that's like the spirit of Vatican too. Okay, <laughs> um, the idea that the um, that at mass, and I've known this for many, many years, they basically, most of the modern, everybody comes from a good place, okay? They want to be nice, and they want to be, you don't want to say grandma's right now, suffering in purgatory, even if she had the grace to make it there and not suffering in hell. My goodness, she wouldn't want to say that as a pastor, right? But there are polite ways of, of encouraging people to say, you know, but the problem is you have you know, grandma's in a better place now. She's looking down on us from heaven and everything else. And I used to joke with uh, the kids at the summer camp and things like that years and years ago. I said, you know, if you come back and if you if I'm dying, you say that about me in, in um, you know, on my deathbed, I'll come back to haunt you, you know, because basically what are you doing? You're taking a whole area, the church suffering, and saying no one goes there. No one is even there. There's no reason for it whatsoever in theology. If you're not bringing all those things to the actual, you know, putting it on the table, you are doing that by just bypassing it completely, trying to be pastoral, trying to be nice, but man, you're cutting somebody out of a lot of prayers there. Yeah, there's just so much misinformation today about what happens to your soul after you die. And you know, so, so many people going to funerals, just assuming, oh yeah, they're in heaven, or some people thinking ridiculous things, like, oh yeah, they become an angel, you know, just so much misinformation. The fact is the vast majority of souls, once they die, they're either gonna be in hell or purgatory. You know, very, very few people are gonna go directly to heaven because it's just so, uh, it requires either an act of martyrdom or, or just extreme, uh, just holiness and heroic virtues and that sort of thing. So very likely either the soul's in hell or they're in purgatory. Um, and the best thing you can do for that soul is pray, pray. Don't ever assume that they're just happy in heaven. They could be in total agony in purgatory, begging their family to remember them in prayer and for you to just assume they're in heaven. You're not doing them any favors. You're not helping them at all. Uh, but you talked about love and how, you know, coming to God in love, in, in contrition out of love is a more perfect um, kind of contrition. Well, love is the main reason why the souls are suffering in purgatory. It's really love of God because it is said that at the moment of death, they're given a very brief um, glimpse of the beatific vision, just a very brief glimpse, and it completely fills them with the love of God, and then it's taken away, and then they have to go do their expiation, and their entire time, they're simply longing to return to God, and they can't. They're, they're, they're unable to until they finish expiating for their sins. Obviously, they're different types of expiations for the kinds of sin you know that they've committed, if it's sins of the tongue or sins of pride or impurity, there are different ways in which your soul is purged. But it's it's likened to a fire, a purifying fire that is burning you through, purifying you, getting you ready to go to heaven. And it's extremely painful according to the saints that some people say that it's like all the sufferings of hell except it comes to an end. And I actually wanted to share um, with our viewers a very, very fascinating museum in Rome 
It's the Museum of the Suffering Souls. And these are artifacts that have left been that, from souls that have actually visited relatives and friends asking them to pray. And as a mark uh, that they were there, they would actually leave like a burnt imprint or something, just a, as an indication of we're burning in the fires of purgatory, pray for us. I want to share actually two different stories. I think we have a graphic here. Um, we have one from uh, right there. This is actually uh, the burnt imprint of uh, a, a mother of Joseph Lelot's Madame Lelot, who appeared in Woodick, Belgium in 1789. She actually appeared to her son uh, 11 nights in a row. He was here, in, sorry, he was hearing strange noises for 11 nights in a row and kept waking up and he was terrified on the 12th night, which was June 21st, 1789. His mother appeared to him to remind him of his duty to have masses said for her soul in compliance with the terms of a legacy that was left to him by his father because he hadn't done that. She also reproached him for the way that he was living his life. He wasn't being faithful. And she asked him, change your life, offer these masses for me. And as a sign that, that she came there, like, like she said, she you know, burnt her, her hands onto the um, nightshirt. Another one, we have another graphic here. Uh, this is from 1838 in Lorraine, France. Uh, George Sheets, his brother who had died, appeared to him on the last night of the year, New Year's Eve, 1838. He asked for prayers and his brother said that he was actually in purgatory making expiation for the fact that he had a lack of piety during his life. And he touched George's prayer book and you could see the burn marks left from his fingerprints. But it's a fascinating museum because it has a bunch of other artifacts just like this showing the reality of the holy souls and how they're suffering. Oh, yeah, and it just reminds me of the whole idea that, you know, the importance to to reach out to these souls and the, these souls can, if they're allowed by God, reach out back to us and, you know, help us in our own spiritual life. And, you know, getting back to that whole idea of love and, and charity, St. Paul actually talks about this in 1 Corinthians. He says, you know, you could, you could know everything about theology, you can have all the knowledge, you can be a prophet of God, you can have this faith to move mountains, but if you don't have that charity, you are nothing. And that's what those souls in Purgatory are are doing on our behalf and that's what we should reciprocate by, by showing them you know that same that exact same love and two you talked about uh, also the you know how those those souls are actually suffering in purgatory remember many people don't realize this they think that suffering is only for those in hell no uh, it's a different type of suffering you know for a different reason in hell it's more of a punishment in purgatory it's this it's literally that you know that word where we get purgatory from it's that purging it's that getting the dross out as scripture talks about because those souls in purgatory, yes, they desire to be in heaven. Obviously, that's where they're headed eventually. You know, different spiritual time, it takes different souls to get there is, is another thing. But they're going to heaven. They desire to be in heaven, obviously. But if you were to uh, if you were to talk to a soul in purgatory right now, he would say this. He would say, well, I, I want to go through this suffering mm -hmm. because as scripture tells us, nothing impure can enter heaven, right? So he says, yes, give me all of that purging so I can be spotless without blemish to enter the beatitude. Vision. Yeah, there's people out there wondering, you know, doesn't the Bible, you know, God is all love, God is love, how could he condemn me to such suffering or maybe even to hell? And the, the thing is, he's not judging himself on how much he's loved us. He's really judging us on how much we've loved him. And if he's all love, well, we certainly aren't all love. We aren't all charity. It's, an, it's kind of a mixed bag. Um, and other people out there, you know, well, I'm Catholic. It reminds me of the inner city uh, years ago. I was in, uh, about this time of year, we were on a, a hayride in the uh, inner city uh, Hispanic, uh, about 15, 16 year old. There was a bunch of them on the, from the Sacred Heart in, uh, in, in, from Connecticut uh, inner parish. Anyway, he's by his hands on his girlfriend and everything. And I was a Franciscan back in the day. And they were like, well, what's this all about? Well, you know, poverty, chastity, obedience. They had no problem with poverty and obedience, but chastity. He's like, we don't fool around. I was like, no, but you know, you can't either. And, you know, until you're married. And he says, well, um, even if you're Catholic? <laughs> and I said, well, especially if you're Catholic. He goes, well, I thought Vatican II changed all that. I'm quoting him. He's 15, 16, Hispanic boy on wagon ride. And so this mentality out there, okay. Well, here's First Peter, uh, St. Peter in, four, in, in epistle, uh, his first epistle, chapter 4, verse 17, 18. He says, judgment uh, will begin at the house of God. So, you know, with Catholics first, okay, and, and all the people of God, those who are baptized, those of good faith and all this. And if first with us, he says, what shall be the end of them that believe 
not the gospel of God. And if the just man shall scarcely be saved, what sh uh, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? And I can't help but think about the people today who are kind of sort of quasi-Catholic, want to be Catholic in some name, maybe were baptized but have gone off into all sorts of irregular, you know, same-sex unions or whatever, you know, and different things. And pa people are just kind of gambling that they're still in invincible ignorance. It seems like that's where the pastor, a lot of pastors are there today, just saying, well, I'm sure they're a good person. I'm sure they're just in ignorance and all this type of stuff. And they're content to leave them there. You want to leave them in that gambling on their future, basically. Where's the charity in that, that you would not offer them the truth of what Christ gave us? That it's not, I'm going to only give you a little bit of the truth here and just say, well, you don't really need the rest of the truth. Uh, man, you, you know, if you really believed in the reality of purgatory and hell and all this type of stuff, as a Catholic, you have to. As a Christian, you have to. And not offer that to the person seems like very it's not very pastoral to me I wanted to encourage people um, to this is just a little booklet it's called Novena for the relief of the poor souls in purgatory I'll hold it up uh, but this is this is a wonderful month it's a great time to pray this I've prayed this before it's very helpful because it focuses your mind on um, the holy souls and, and their need for help but I actually wanted to I think anecdotes help to bring to life um, the impact our prayers can have on holy souls and also that they can help us but there's one short anecdote it provides like real life anecdotes for each day's meditation here's one um, uh, it was about uh, you know a poor servant girl who had a great devotion to the holy souls and she would make sure that every single month she would have a mass offered for the holy souls and uh, she had spent some time in the hospital out of sickness she was leaving the hospital uh, she was in need of a job very poor um, she decided to stop in the local church just to make sure that she could make an offering for the holy souls for a mass and uh, as she's leaving it says she sees a young man come up to her he was tall and pale and of a noble demeanor and he comes up to her and says, I think that you're in need of a position. And she surprised, she says yes. And he says, well, if you go to Mrs. Such and Such down the road, I think you will find a good place. Then he just kind of walks off in the crowd. She goes, finds the house that he indicated, knocks on the door and presents her petition to have a job there as a housekeeper. And the lady said, yes, you know, and I do need a, a housekeeper, but how did you know that? Because I haven't told anybody. And uh, the girl looks over at the wall, she sees the portrait of a man and she says, oh, well, that man looked exactly like that. He came and told me. And the woman gasps and she says, that's my son. He died two years ago. Um, and so she says at these words, you, know, um, you shall henceforth remain with me, not just as a servant girl, but as my daughter. And so she took her in and not only did she have a, a, a job, she had kind of a, an adopted mother. So this is one of the ways that holy souls can help us. Yeah, and we never know who these people are. They might be you know, people that we don't know um, or people that are even in our, our own family, kind of getting back to what we're talking about with the whole funeral idea. You go to a funeral and most priests today, unfortunately, they'll, they'll assume they're in heaven. But what a disservice that we're doing to our own family members where we're depriving them of our potential prayers if they are indeed in purgatory, which they probably are. And it's not just with our own family member. It's it's the random you know cemeteries that we drive by every day. I, uh, I I would say I'm fortunate enough to have a cemetery right across the street from our, our neighborhood actually. And so when I take my kids on walks or on bike rides or whatever, we always necessarily go by this cemetery. And I've inculcated that habit in them. Pray for the holy souls that are in that cemetery because I mean you can bet on the fact that there's no one praying for some of yes. these souls. There's no one who visits them. You know some of these people were buried in the 18 hundreds or whatever yep. and they have no one to pray for them and that's it's very efficacious because we uh, have St. Alphonsus Liguori several saints talk about how efficacious it is to pray for these holy souls in purgatory Alphonsus Liguori says this if we want to help the souls in purgatory then we should say a rosary for them because the rosary gives them great relief and think about what that soul does when that soul gets to heaven let's say it was your that particular prayer that you said that potentially was you know the straw that was needed to break that camel's back of getting them into heaven how much more are they going to intercede on your behalf when they're in heaven? Yeah, the uh, two other books that were really, um, we have one in our library. Uh, you can get it from Church Milton, I believe. Father, Father Martin von Kochem, The Four Last Things. It's just an epic book on it. Of course, purgatory is one of the four last things. Death, uh, judgment, heaven, and hell. But that would be covered in there. The other one that I found very helpful um, in my late 20s reading it really had a lot of the same stories that Christine was bringing up there about someone would 
appear in a monastery and say, pray for me and leave the handprint in the middle of the wooden table burned into there. And they would bring the bishop in and say, yeah, this is what happened. And it'd be written down in affidavit's testimony. Was Father Shope Purgatory Explained? Great, great book on it. Very thick, lots of stuff there. And they also have one that Hell Explained. But Purgatory Explained really details all of the church's uh, antidotes and incidences of all this, but also the theology behind all of that, that really helps you get an understanding that it really is God's mercy that he, and, and just necessary that you need to be cleansed, you need to be purified if you've committed some sins, but you've, you know, impartially, you know, a lack of not complete retreat, contrition or haven't really expiated them in this lifetime, that you still need to take care of that before going to heaven. God is just, is all just, but also has this as a means to do that. And like you say, you know, it's like going to a wedding and you see right before you enter into the wedding, um, you know, this, the stain on your, you know, if it's a lady on her, on her white wedding dress or whatever, and you, or you're aghast, you want this stain to be, you know, you're not going to go in front of the, the, into the wedding that way. So you want to have that stain removed. And they're like a little side, hey, go over here, we'll get that stain off of there. Now you can enter into the wedding banquet, um, you know, with your wedding garment completely, um, you know, uh, shiny and everything like that. And that's, our Lord used the same terminology of wedding and a wedding garment and that type of thing, your, your soul and the state that it's in. Yeah. So. And not just real quick before we close, you know, um, another wonderful book in addition to that is St. Alphonsus Liguori's Preparation for Death. Anybody can, you don't have to be old to read it. Everyone should read it. It's a wonderful book, Meditations on Death. Again, not to be morbid or anything like that, but we all have to face death. And the point is of this life is that we can face death with a clear conscience in the state of grace, ready to meet God. Um, and just as a reminder, um, people are dying every single day. Globally, every, every single day, 330,000 people are dying at least, maybe more than that. That means 14,000 every hour, 230 every minute, four people dying every second. Every day, people are dying. Every moment, people are dying. You're gonna be one of those people. Be ready. And it's not COVID that's responsible for all of those. So, <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us for today's episode of The Download. Now, please join us as we finish in prayer, begging Our Lady's intercession for our nation and our church. In the Father, and in the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Save Regina, Mater Misericordiae, Vita Lucendo, et spes nostra save. A te clamamos, exules fili heve. A te suspiramos, gementes et flentes, in hac lacrima rumbale. Ea ergo, advocata nostra, Ilos tuos misericordes oculos, ad nos converte, et iesum benedictum fructum ventris tui, nobis post hoc exilium ostende. O clemens, O pia, O dulcis Virgo Maria. Amen. 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 the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you again for joining us for the download. We premiere a new episode like this every weekday at 5 p.m. Eastern Time. From all of us here at Church Militant, God bless you.